this session. The idea for this session arose about a week ago at the corner of Bathurst and Lawrence Streets in Toronto. There was a rally at the Office of Canada's Immigration Minister, part of a national campaign to improve the immigration, working and health status of migrant workers in this country. Several DN members were in the crowd. We heard impassioned speeches from migrant workers and their supporters about adverse immigration policies, difficult working conditions, and now COVID-19 outbreaks. I have to say that as I listened, I heard echoes. Decades earlier, those would have been Jewish garment workers on Spadina Avenue complaining of sweatshop working conditions. Those would have been Jewish community leaders urgently calling on the government to ease immigration entry for Jews. And then of course, there was the voice of Torah calling on us to treat the stranger in our midst well. So this is an important conversation for our synagogues, for Jews, and for all Canadians. It was Dorothy Lichtblau who suggested a week ago at Bathurst and Lawrence that we educate ourselves further about migrant workers in Canada. Great idea, Dorothy. And it turns out that within our Darche Noam synagogue, we have several experts on the situation migrant workers face in Canada. So we have brought them together for tonight's conversation. Here's our format for the evening. First, we'll hear from our four panelists. Then we'll open things up for questions and we'll close with final comment from our panelists. We expect the entire session should run maybe an, an hour and a half or so. We'll provide instructions on how you can raise questions when we get to that stage of the program. But now let me introduce our four presenters in their speaking order. First up will be Naomi Alboin. Naomi is a distinguished fellow at the School of Policy Studies at Queen's University, and she is the Senior Policy Fellow at Ryerson Center of Excellence in Research Chair in Migration Studies. Previously, Ms. Alboim worked at senior levels in the Canadian federal and Ontario provincial governments for 25 years, including eight years as Deputy Minister. Naomi is a member of the Order of Ontario, she is a widely sought after speaker and advisor on immigration policy, and that will be the focus of her remarks tonight. Next up will be David McKee. He's now a retired lawyer. For 20 years, he practiced with a labor law firm in Toronto representing unions and employees, followed by 19 years as a vice chair of the Ontario Labor Relations Board. In the two years since his retirement, he reports, he has not had to justify the labor laws of Ontario, not even once. David will focus his remarks tonight on labor laws. Marianne Levitsky is an industrial hygienist, a profession that specializes in the assessment and control of workplace health hazards. She was previously a director in several Ontario government agencies and has been consulting for the past 10 years. She is adjunct faculty at the University of Toronto and was the founding president of Workplace Health Without Borders, an NGO devoted to promoting global workplace health. And our final speaker will be Kaylee Glick. Kaylee describes herself as a busker a food justice enthusiast, and a labor rights agitator. She'll be connecting a lot of dots in her comments later this evening. So can I suggest from the gallery a vigorous round of visual hand clapping in the gallery for our impressive panel? Thanks to each of you for joining us and being part of this uh, important conversation. And so to begin the conversation, uh, um, Naomi, uh, Naomi, I wonder if, if you could get us uh, uh, started uh, almost by setting a context and even terminology for, this, for this, this evening. We've been reading a lot, especially in recent weeks and hearing a lot in the media about migrant workers, about temporary foreign workers. Who are those people in Canada? 
I I am unmuted. Okay. Um, well, uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me to participate here in in this panel. I look forward to hearing all the all the panelists. Um, I must say that from my conversation with Meyer, and given um, what I'm being what I'm preoccupied with right now, um, I, and because the topic is so big, yes. I've actually decided to focus on agricultural workers. And certainly during the q and A, I'm more than happy to go broadly or more broadly than that, or if Meyer, you have follow-up questions about others, I'm more than happy to address that. But it is a really big topic. And um, the agricultural workers certainly have been in the forefront recently. So let me tell you who they are. Um, first of all, the agricultural workforce in Canada is comprised of many, many different people. They're domestic workers who are both citizens and permanent residents. Uh, there are people who work permanently in the agricultural sector. There are those who work only seasonally in the agricultural sector. And there are those who are owner operators. The seasonal workers um, are about 113,000 of, uh, of that overall uh, population. There are about 100,000 who work permanently in the sector. And there are about 190,000 people who both own and operate uh, their own farms. In 2018, um, there were 55,000 jobs filled by temporary foreign workers in the agricultural sector. And that comprised 20% of the total labor force in that sector. And the vast majority of them were in what we call horticulture, which was you know, fruits and vegetables, greenhouses, nurseries. Um, and most of them, in fact, were in greenhouses and nurseries. And that's important because greenhouses and nurseries are often longer than just the short growing season. There were 3,800 approximately farms in Canada that employed at least one temporary foreign worker. 68% uh, of them worked in large farms with gross receipts of $2 million or more. So the vast majority are not working on mom and pop size farms. They're working in the really big um, farms. Uh, they come from approximately 100 different countries to work on the farms in Canada but the uh, majority come from Mexico, Guatemala, and Jamaica. 51% of them come from Mexico, 20% of them come from Guatemala, 18% come from Jamaica. Most of them work in Ontario or Quebec. Ontario employs 31% and Quebec 26%. BC is third with 21%. Um, and they come to Canada in different streams. Um, the one that most people know about is the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, which is called uh, SOP for short. But there are lots of others who come in the Temporary Foreign Worker Low Wage Agricultural Program. Um, then anyone with a work permit can work on the farms. Um, and then there are undocumented people. And I'm just going to go quickly through each of those uh, categories. For the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, that program was created a long time ago, more than 50 years ago. Started in 1966. Um, and it started because there was a labor shortage uh, of people prepared to work in the farms because of the seasonal nature of the jobs, because of the rural locations, and because of the physical nature of, uh, of the work. Initially, um, there were bilateral agreements with only uh, Jamaica and Mexico, and those have now expanded to uh, other countries in the Caribbean as well. And those bilateral agreements are between Canada and the sending countries. Um, that's pretty unique uh, in terms of our uh, other temporary foreign workers. We don't have those kinds of bilateral agreements for many other uh, sectors. And those bilateral agreements mean that the Seasonal Agriculture Worker Program is very controlled. It's very rule bound with obligations on the part of uh, uh, employers, uh, on the part of Canada and on the part of the, uh, the sending country. And some of these rules deal with um, transportation, with housing, with pay, with health and safety coverage. 
Um, and there are actual employment contracts that each of the individuals uh, enters into. They do come here, however, on employer specific work permits. And that's really important. That means that the employer who is hiring them has to get approval, demonstrating there are no local uh, people prepared to do that work or available to do that work. And once they get that labor market um, assessment from uh, the government, they are able to hire uh, temporary foreign workers uh, from abroad. But the worker must work for that particular employer and is bound to that particular employer, which raises all kinds of issues, which I'll get into um, in a moment. Um, the, um, uh, there are also, because of those bilateral agreements, people working for <clears throat> the consulates of the sending countries, the home countries, who act as liaison officers and whose job, as far as the home country is concerned, is to make sure that their nationals are well taken care of here in Canada. Um, there is also an organization called FARMS, F-A-R-M-S, which is a kind of, um, it's a private sector organization that really works on behalf of the employers to uh, coordinate the um, uh, receipt of temporary foreign workers, uh, the recruitment, the selection, and the um, uh, reception of those workers once they, they come to Canada. Work is eight months. Uh, and that's really important too, because a lot of our agriculture now is longer than an eight month period, but that's the maximum for this category of people. Um, and employers have the right to call back people season after season after season. And many of the people who come in under that program have in fact come to Canada for years. Uh, but it all depends on the employer asking for them, which again makes the individuals quite uh, vulnerable um, to their employer's uh, wishes. Uh, there is no pathway to permanent residency for people who come in to, under this program and they must go home after eight months when their visa is over. Another stream, which is very different, which has less controls, fewer controls, people come in under the low wage agricultural stream. And that stream was put into effect specifically for those jobs that last longer than eight months. For example, hydroponics or nurseries or um, uh, some uh, work in uh, with animal husbandry, whatever, which is a 12 month operation and not purely an eight month. Those individuals, um, the employers can get labor market assessments that last for two years and visas can be two years. Uh, their work permits can be two years in, in uh, duration. There are no bilateral agreements with ascending countries. So there are no liaison officers or people who were there supposedly to, uh, to look after uh, their nationals. Um, there are some rules in terms of transportation, housing, whether it's on or off the farm. They too must have an employer specific work permit and they too have no pathway to permanent residency. In addition to that, I know I'm taking a long time, I just wanna lay out the, 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 the stage. In addition to that, people with even fewer rights potentially are um, anyone with a work permit. Anybody who is here in Canada with a work permit, they don't fall into the other two categories. And it could be someone who, who's here as an international student who works on the farm, gets, have, they have a work permit to work when they're not in school. Uh, they can work on a farm. Refugee claimants can work on farms if, if they have uh, work permits. Um, uh, people who come from New Zealand or Australia on adventures um, can come and work on farms because they have uh, work permits as well. And there are no particular rules for these individuals other than those that exist uh, in the provinces in terms of um, uh, labor standards. And then there is a growing group of people who are undocumented, who have no legal permission to work as temporary foreign workers and have no, uh, there are no rules uh, in terms of, uh, of their treatment. 
Naomi, that is such an important and, and, and helpful overview of the landscape of, of how work is structured in Canada's agricultural sector. Um, what, um, you've expressed some criticisms of elements of that framework. What, what troubles you about that framework for organizing work in Canada's agricultural sector? Well, there are lots of concerns. Um, first of all, there is very, very minimal enforcement of all the provisions which on paper actually look quite good. Um, but there's no real proactive enforcement. It's primarily complaint driven. And people who are here on permits who are depending on these jobs for money for their families back home are unlikely to complain. There are no, there are very few sort of proactive random uh, spot checks, on-site visits without uh, prior notice to the employers. So that's uh, a very significant problem. The second problem is that everybody is involved and therefore nobody is accountable. There are three federal government departments involved in this program. There are every provincial um, ministry across the country, all of which have different rules. And the local municipalities are responsible for public health. Um, there is very little coordination between the three levels of government. Um, and um, uh, there's no, there are no national standards um, because of the different uh, approaches to this uh, across, uh, across the country. Um, the other thing is that the employer specific permits really make people very vulnerable because their status in Canada is dependent on them working for that particular employer. Um, if they leave that employer, they are breaking uh, the rules. So they want to please. Uh, they are like, unlikely to um, complain very vigorously or uh, to deny or to refuse to do work that might be potentially um, uh, dangerous. Uh, those employer-specific permits really breed uh, vulnerability. And there's no mobility. Um, so, um, uh, and they only uh, get potentially an open work permit if they complain. An open work permit means that they can work for more than for any employer, not just for the employer who, uh, who brought them in. Um, they are ineligible for any kind of federal settlement services, so there aren't sort of organizations funded by the government uh, with lots of experience they can go to for any kind of help or, or advice. They pay into employment insurance but aren't eligible to, uh, to benefit from that. Um, and COVID has certainly shown uh, that the housing is inadequate, the working conditions are inadequate to maintain uh, safety or to prevent spread. And as you may remember, the provincial government even said that if they're asymptomatic, uh, they still should be um, uh, going to work. There are very few self-isolation possibilities. BC has, is the one province that actually has addressed some of these issues and addressed them well. These workers have an outsider status because of where they work, how they work, um, and that's very difficult in terms of when they go into the local towns to do their, uh, their purchasing for their um, uh, very essential supplies. And perhaps most importantly, there is no pathway to permanent residency. So they are uh, permanently temporary, even if they come back uh, year uh, after year after year. There Na is Naomi, I'm going to jump in and ask you just as a last question, why is the issue of citizenship and permanent residency so important? Oh, <laughs> permanent residency. Well, citizenship, first of all, the only way you can become a citizen is if you first are a permanent resident. So there's no way that you can become a citizen unless you're a permanent resident first and pay your dues and meet the criteria. When you're a permanent resident, perhaps the most important feature is that you have mobility rights. And you can move. If you aren't happy with your particular job, you can go to another job. Uh, you have full rights with the exception of voting. You have full rights. Um, but it really is the ability to feel that um, you can complain uh, if you're being mistreated because it's not going to affect your status in Canada. 
you're not going to be deported because you're a temporary person with no permanency here in uh, in Canada. So the um, uh, you remove much of the vulnerability the temporary foreign workers face if they are permanent residents on the way to citizenship. Naomi, I know that you've given a lot of thought and advice to various people about how to rectify the situation that you've described for us in such important uh, uh, scope and scope and detail. And I'm going to come back and ask you what the what the magic formula is for for improving this situation. But uh, uh, I'm going to bring David McKee into this discussion now. Um, David, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, um, uh, spent a career working in the field of labor law. And uh, uh, David, I want to ask you at the outset, how, how would you characterize the working rights that apply to these migrant workers in Ontario? Well, uh, you um, asked me initially whether I thought uh, migrant workers were second class um, second class workers in Canada. Um, I'm not sure they actually get that high up the food chain. Hmm. Um, the uh, second class implies some kind of comparison. Uh, so let's start by comparing those workers with agricultural workers who are citizens or permanent residents have every right to be here. Those are the second class workers. Um, they are employed. Uh, many public statutes apply to them. The Labor Relations Act does not apply to them. They are governed by something called the Agricultural Employees Protection Act, which is a title which is sort of a sick joke from the Ernie Eves days. Um, it allows employees to join unions. Uh, they can try to bargain with their employer. Their employer is under no obligation to bargain, no obligation to sign a collective agreement, and employees can't strike. That's the whole act. Um, they are covered by other uh, public statutes, for instance, the Employment Standards Act, except that there is an exception for certain provisions of the Employment Standards Act, hours of work, eating periods, overtime pay, minimum wage, public holidays, and vacations with pay. Um, I've never uh, quite understood that rationale. Um, in 1968, I worked on my uncle's farm in Manitoba, a much more agricultural province, and there was a minimum wage and there was a maximum number of hours that one could work. Um, however, not so in Ontario. There are people who do the work um, and uh, not enough of them, um, which may have to do with the fact that it's hard work may have to do with the fact that you're outdoors in the sunshine and may have to do with the wages you're paid. Um, temporary workers um, differ in two respects. Um, as Naomi said, um, mobility, which is the most important issue, um, is a, a very large difference um, in those in, and to some extent, where you're staying. Um, there are lots of crummy places to stay. I don't mean that everyone in Canada is well housed, but you will be in group quarters that may be um, of uh, limited uh, desirability. Um, the uh, employer is obliged to fly you here and to provide room and board, basically. However, the uh, requirement um, the federal government satisfies itself that this is a decent place to live by asking the employer to provide a report. The employer retains a third party inspector and pays the third party inspector for a report that they send on to the government. Um, and if you don't have one handy, eight months back is good enough. Or there's a special regulation I don't understand at all for COVID-19, which three years seems to be enough. Um, the uh, Probably the additional problem is this is a sort of practical solution gone bad. Under the uh, Ontario um, Occupational Health and Safety Act, there is a right for inspectors to go and uh, inspect a workplace. And in fact, they're obliged to go and inspect a workplace. 
uh, if there's a complaint, um, anonymous or named. Uh, sometime uh, about 10 years back, um, the government of Ontario decided they were going to change that because they were getting a lot of calls from the jails, particularly around bargaining time. The closer you got to the crunch, the greater the number of uh, complaints, especially around two or three in the morning uh, about things that happened every single day and everybody knew those were the conditions of work. So they said, all right, we'll do it by telephone. We can, and they were right, they could figure out whether this was a bogus complaint or not. But like any practical solution, people say, oh, we can do this. So then it became quite common and that's how they did it. And uh, since the beginning of the concern about COVID-19, federal uh, inspectors who receive complaints phone. And guess who they talk to? And uh, you can imagine how effective that uh, kind of examination is. So that the um, work, the uh, place where people are living are inherently dangerous and inherently uh, not subject to uh, the sort of control that in theory uh, people are. D David, can I jump in to ask you, uh, um, it's interesting, you've identified a whole range of adversities that, that um, migrant farm workers can encounter from their working conditions, their pay, their living conditions. Um, if they wanted correctives, is there any legal route or, or, or resource or strategy that exists for them to seek redress for hours of work, for pay, for living conditions, for working conditions? Is there anything? Um, the uh, enforcement is entirely through a complaint to um, um, the, those who administer the contract. Um, there's a particular the contract is signed in Mexico or in Jamaica or in Guatemala before you get here. It's great. It's 25 pages long. There are three pages of definitions and it, the uh, instructions are, you may not change this. These are the terms. Uh, you, you don't have any negotiating power here, but yes, if you're not being paid the, pay, the wages you were contracted for. You can complain about that and people will do that. And obviously you can complain at the end of your eight months. Um, and if you're entitled to it, hopefully you will get it. You're not in the country. How, in theory, you can get it. How effective that remedy is, I don't know. Other complaints, well, in theory, the Occupational Health and Safety Act applies, and you could call a provincial inspector who might make an order. Not if they're calling on the phone. And uh, again, the effectiveness depends really on, on the willingness of those uh, involved. And as Naomi said, it's always easy to pass the buck when you have three levels of government involved, um, mm -hmm. or even just quarreling about whose specific bailiwick this falls into. Um, Naomi's covered the uh, um, sort of general structure of the uh, uh, employment contract. A couple of other things, though, that um, I just wanted details that I wanted to cover. Um, the employer flies people here and flies them back. And uh, you know you can either pay for the fare and you adjust the wage rate, or you pay a higher wage rate and people make their own way here. However, that's how it's done. Um, the problem is the airfare home. If you need to go back for medical reasons, it's paid one way or the other, by government or by the employer. However, if you are guilty of, and this is the phrase, non-compliance, refusal to work, or any other sufficient reason, as if you're fired, you quit, you pay your own way home. So there's a financial cost right there to say, I don't, I've had enough of this, I'm leaving, or uh, engaging in behavior that gets, gets you fired, rightly or not. Any other sufficient reason is a pretty wide, um, wide definition of what you might have done wrong. David, on, on your last point of involuntary departures, uh, uh, I was quite surprised to read, I think, uh, um, in one of the papers over the last week, uh, numbers released on the number of deportations of uh, migrant farm workers in a five or, or 10 year period. It was in the thousands. In other words, uh, in midst of, of their employment for one reason or another, which could have been poor work performance, but equally could have been complaining about work conditions. 
uh, migrant workers being deported back to terminated and deported back is 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 that a common phenomenon or is that something that can happen within the framework of of, of uh, uh, temporary agricultural work? Oh, certainly. If if the employment relationship comes to an end, either because you've been fired or because you quit, you have no status to be in the country. The three conditions on your work permit are that you work for a named employer, says how long you can work, and it identifies the location where you can work. So if you're not bringing yourself within those three, you have no right to be here and you will be deported. Um, we certainly saw enough of that with undocumented workers in the construction industry, which actually is covered by the Labor Relations Act. It's a great way of handling troublemakers. Or people yeah, who employ. Yeah. 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 Suddenly yeah. an employer will get a conscience and say, oh, I better report myself. I've hired an undocumented worker. Yeah. Um, so what it means is that employees are less likely to uh, complain very loudly about the, the uh, conditions in which they are housed. And it means they can't go, say, if there's strawberry pickers who were pretty desperate this year for workers, um, you're not going to go bare and look for, uh, for better wages. Um, I thought just if I can indulge in a bit of history. Um, that... David, I'll, I'll ask you to be brief on that because I'm going to move soon to Marianne and a discussion specifically of the occupational health and safety picture for these workers. Just to give you a sort of sense of the importance of mobility. Uh, and I don't mean to suggest temporary workers are slaves. When slavery was abolished, 1834 in the British Caribbean, after the Civil War in the US, the first thing the planter class did was to control mobility. Year long contracts, you've got a date to negotiate a new one, you're a vagrant if you don't have one. That meant people were basically stuck where they were in place. That was how they controlled labor. That's how they controlled labor, the labor wages. It also created a racist society, but the primary object in many cases was simply controlling the mobility of wages of workers because that was what controlled the cost of labor. And it applies just as much to temporary workers here. David and uh, uh, Naomi, previously you've given us a, a pretty stark picture of a uh, controlled um, workforce that uh, we could anticipate would have some problems on the job here in Canada. And one of the manifestations of those problems is uh, adverse um, occupational health and safety uh, experiences, now most recently with outbreaks of uh, COVID. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, Marianne Levitsky is a um, long-standing experienced uh, um, occupational health and safety specialist. So Marianne, welcome to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mar Marianne, what do we know about the health and safety uh, circumstances of uh, temporary farm workers? Uh, in a word, not very good. Um, it wouldn't, won't surprise you after hearing uh, David and Naomi, if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna share some slides. I'll kind of, um, scroll through the things that I think people already covered. Can, can you see them now? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, a lot of this I think Naomi did cover, but this is just a graphic picture of where in Ontario these temporary agricultural workers are. And I'm going to focus as Naomi did on the agricultural workers, especially the temporary ones. So the, the red colors are the areas uh, where uh, most of the farm workers are, are employed and the other colors indicate the countries they came from, which Naomi has already covered. Um, you asked me uh, if they had health and safety problems before COVID, and certainly the answer is yes. Uh, they, they work very, very hard. They generally want to work very, very hard. Um, that is, they want to work long hours because they're paid by the hour. So they work about six to seven days a week, and um, sometimes more than 12 hours a day. Uh, so you can imagine some of the health effects that just might result from overwork. They live in employer provided housing and David and Naomi both covered this. This is a big, big problem. It was a problem before COVID and it's really responsible for the, um, a lot of the current problems. Um, many of them, as you saw, came from Mexico, came from Latin America, um, speak Spanish, do not speak English. 
we already spoke to the problem of not leaving the employer they're assigned to, which essentially means um, they're subject to the, whatever kind of bad conditions um, they, they encounter. So even before COVID, there were a lot of health problems and there are a number of um, migrant worker advocacy organizations that have detailed this very well. Uh, the graph here is from a clinic funded by the Ontario government through the WSIB called the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers. So you can see, and this is the, the people they've treated. Um, this is pre-COVID. Uh, most of the problems were musculoskeletal because they're working so hard, so back problem. But they had a number of other problems, as well as there were a number of real tragic um, safety incidents, especially vehicle collisions. And I don't know if people remember, but we had a number of incidents where many, quite a few workers were being transported in a vehicle, no, not strapped in. In one case, quite a number of them died. There was an inquest. So um, certainly uh, health and safety was not the best even before uh, the current development. Um, so what's the story with COVID among the Ontario agricultural workers? Well, um, the, of course, the Ontario government was very concerned about COVID, but their main concern, it seemed, before they came was that they might give it to Ontario residents. So they required that they be quarantined for 14 days upon arrival and that they would be paid for 30 hours a week during that quarantine period. You could see they generally work many, many hours in excess of that. So this was really low pay to them and they were taking a, a quite a financial hit. Um, as of July 7th, according to the Toronto Star, a thousand of COVID workers had been, sorry, <laughs> agricultural workers had been affected with, with COVID. And uh, this was, there are largely out, outbreaks of multiple and large numbers of workers. And I'll get to why in, in, in a minute. There have been three deaths. I've listed their names here, so we don't forget them and we honor them uh, with their two pictures of two of them from the Globe and Mail. Um, one of them was an undocumented worker. Uh, one of them died in his hotel room because when, when they're, came positive, they were uh, quarantined or isolated in motels. And they would usually be visited once a day, somebody would check in on them. But one of these workers worsened um, a lot in sort of in between visits, he called 911. And by the time they came, he had died. So just the idea of somebody dying alone in a hotel room far from home is just, just heartbreaking. I'm sure all of us can, can relate to that. Um, I think as um, uh, Naomi mentioned, they can, they, at least uh, up until a point, the Ontario government was letting them work even if they tested positive for COVID. And we know that many people who have COVID-19 are asymptomatic, that is, they're not manifesting symptoms. So that was kind of the rationale. They, they may have wanted to work so they could get paid more than 30 hours a week but mostly it was the employers who advocated for this. But of course, think of the pressure of not reporting that you in fact have symptoms if you're positive. Um, so I can't imagine that they were not pressured to work even when they were sick. And of course, if they were testing positive, they were supposed to be isolated and cohorted with other people who tested positive. So they would not give it to anyone else. Clearly that, that did not work. Um, so you asked me why, why were they getting COVID? Well, the simplest answer is, is overcrowding. I mean, you know, certainly we know all about the six feet, two meters separation we're all supposed to maintain. Most likely they could not maintain it at work, but in particular, they were housed in extremely crowded conditions. Um, and we know that indoor and densely populated areas will spread the virus, even if people try to stay six feet apart. And if you can try to imagine uh, 20 more, more people in one bunkhouse, um, how can they stay far apart if they're sharing a kitchen, if they're sharing a washroom? And even if they are, um, just the, the poor ventilation will lead to the spread of that. Um, so they had language barriers, they couldn't, um, uh, report their problem. One of the um, incidents I read about was there were a bunch of sick workers and they, they didn't speak English and they could not get help from anyone. And one of them 
communicated via WhatsApp to an advocate in BC, and that BC advocate called 911 in Ontario, if you can imagine that they had to do that to get some help in Ontario. Um, this is a clip uh, on the screen from a, a document called Unheeded Warnings, which is by the Migrant Workers Alliance. It's kind of a chilling read, and this is just one excerpt from it about like the kind of ways they were housed, the way they were transported. Um, I have some other excerpts from it. Here's another picture of a, of a bunkhouse. So you can see how close together they are, um, the impossibility of, of distancing. And of course, this is all in a context of them being extremely um, scared. You know, they don't know what's happening to them. Um, they want to earn money. Um, if they're sick, they're not earning. Um, they are eligible for workers' compensation, but um, we, anybody who's applied for workers' comp knows it's very difficult to get it, and it's not clear they would get it, and uh, so, and it would certainly be less money than they would otherwise get. Uh, so, um, I just want to mention that not all farm employers are bad. We hear about the bad ones. Let, you know, employers come in all types, and some of them are, are good, so let's not think that it's, it's not it's everybody who treats them this way. Um, that uh, this is a article in the Windsor Star about um, a twenty million million dollar housing development being built in Leamington. That's being um, built, um, paid for by one of the employers. It was started before um, the, this whole this year. And this is a quote. Um, I think it pops up here. That he. The, the employer said, it's important for us that our workers are proud of their accomplishment and they're worth it, essentially. And let's remember, these are the people who are providing us with food. And, and some employers do understand that they need to be treated well. So um, I know you were going to ask about what are the problems, but I, I can leave that for later because I think David and Naomi have covered that very well. But I just wanted to mention, this is an example there was a presentation by a Ministry of Labor inspector. Um, and he said, oh, we're working closely with everybody. And just this, this um, uh, quote kind of gives you an idea of the kind of myriad of agencies, especially the feds and the Public Health Ontario and the Health and Safety Partners and the local public health. And you can just imagine, you know, we're just overrun with organizations that are involved and it's I think Naomi said, when everybody's responsible, nobody's responsible. Mm. And one of the big problems is the Ministry of Labor is responsible for health and safety, but they're not responsible for housing. So there's this artificial distinction. You know, they'll come in and expect, inspect the working conditions, but a lot of the problem is, is in the housing. The federal government and now the public health unit, because of COVID, are supposed to inspect that. But um, the federal, we, David talked about some of those problems. They often inspected it remotely. They might have inspected it before anybody was in it. So you couldn't see the conditions when people were in it. Um, so, Marianne, yeah. Marianne if, I, if, I, if I can jump in, um, sure. I, I really want to ask you one question before um, turning over to, uh, to Kaylee. And you know, you've given us a pretty stark picture of the health and safety experiences of temporary, uh, of temporary agricultural workers. One of the things that strikes me is that most of them arrived here in the late winter or spring of this year when Canada was already in lockdown because of COVID. We knew that COVID had descended upon Canada. So the question I wanna ask you is, um, Given what we knew in advance about the conditions that existed for temporary far uh, uh, migrant farm workers, what should have been done? It, it, like, we, we told the workers they should isolate for 14 days. What should have happened on the farms? Well, essentially, good housing, for one thing. I mean, that, that would have been a a really important thing. I mean, the fact that COVID was introduced, we don't know where it came from. So it's very possible they got it from someone. There were temporary workers, especially undocumented workers or temporary agency workers that were working for the farmers in that interim period when the foreign workers were in quarantine. They might have introduced it, so there wasn't a lot of care in terms of separating and isolating those the quarantine workers from um, from others who might have given it to them. 
we heard stories. I mean, that document I showed you um, told stories of employers ignoring that requirement. So if they have been quarantined in good conditions and good housing and truly isolated, I'm sure a lot of this could have been avoided. But there's a lot of rule breaking because there's a real lack of enforcement. And, and this is what happened. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Marianne, for that. And, and um, I'm gonna bring in now Kaylee Glick, who as you heard from my earlier introduction has uh, uh, maybe the most uh, uh, interesting collection of uh, job descriptions and activities of, of anyone on the panel. Combination uh, community gardener, uh, sustainable farming uh, activist, uh, street performer. Um, Kaylee, how do all those things intersect for you with an interest in, this, in the circumstances of uh, migrant farm workers? Very good question. Um, I think that for me, and especially um, on this esteemed panel with all of these <laughs> very renowned, very credentialed people, um, that as a, while my interest in labor does come from my involvement in the community garden network. Really, it comes from being myself a bit of a precarious worker. And when I was thinking about how to sort of frame this subject in preparation for this talk, um, I really thought that the difference between um, my jobs and the jobs of the panelists and potentially many of the audience is a notable difference. Um, so for a little background, I, uh, I'm a street performer and what I do is I write, I'm a poet for hire. So I have a typewriter and I bring it out to the sidewalk and people give me a subject and I write them a poem and they pay me whatever they think it's worth when it's done. Um, and when I first started, became a busker, I think my parents were very worried about uh, that lifestyle, not because poetry or street performance is inherently dangerous, but because it wouldn't afford me things like a salary or a job protection or, um, oh, I had a whole list, uh, you know, air conditioning, for example, easy access to a bathroom on a regular day. Um, those are all ways that my jobs uh, is a lot like your average fruit picker or migrant labor in kind of a number of sectors. Um, so the connection to agriculture specifically, and it's an issue with sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture, industrial agriculture, anywhere that farming happens, um, well, good paying uh, and safe jobs are scarce. Um, I think that, you know, your Ontario strawberries, whether they're organic and pesticide free or not, have been picked by somebody who was not paid a living wage. And so I, in, I think that that's sort of a, a, the conversation to be had is about the kinds of jobs in general that we decide are valuable and not valuable. And the interesting thing about farming, especially in a Jewish context, is that there hasn't really been a point in history where we as a civilization have valued food production. Um, I know I was gonna save this for later, but as, you know, we think about, um, when we talk about being slaves in Egypt, we think of ourselves as building pyramids, or at least that's our, sort of the image I had, but really we were mainly agricultural workers and agricultural slaves. And as a result, so much of Torah focuses on how to set out an agricultural economy, how to produce food in an ethical way beyond just paying your um, employees on time and well. Um, so, yeah, so I guess the piece that I want to bring specifically to this is that, and the conversation I'd sort of like to see happening is that all jobs deserve job security. 
And hearing the panelists, I've learned a ton about all the different ways that different kinds of work is, um, you know, um, organized, so to speak, and paid for and protected and all of these things that these distinctions have a lot more to do with social values than they necessarily do with running a business well or what or the how difficult the work is or any of these things um yeah i think that's sort of where i'll end <laughs> oh you're muted meyer thank you for that uh help kaylee um I, I, I'm curious, in terms of, of um, your network, uh, uh, and I'm thinking of, of uh, um, younger people who you connect with, um, is, is you were at that demonstration, at, ba at that rally at, at, uh, um, at Bathurst and Lawrence a week and a half ago uh, um, in support of migrant farm workers, and there were a lot of young people there. Um, is is that is that an issue from your network, from your friend uh, friends that kind of seizes the attention and the imagination of, of of the younger people in Toronto and in the country? Yeah. So I thank you for that question, which it reminds me of the, the two things that I wanted to say. Um, one is that I wanted to end with a call to action for everybody. That's actually three calls to action. Um, so I, the first answer is yes, this is a conversation that um, my friends are having, although I, I, interestingly, not specifically my community garden friends. Um, but I think that my generation, whether, or my peers, um, my coworkers, whatever, whether we're credentialed or not, we're precariously employed, almost all of us. Um, whether you know, you're a journalist or a nurse or a carpenter or whatever, um, it seems that in my lifetime, a lot of the job protections that may have existed don't really exist anymore in a practical, meaningful way. Um, so I think that that, um is definitely a piece and i think the other piece is that it connects locally to our oh right so this brings me to my two calls of action hmm. um i think i have to can oh, i think i can put these in the chat um the organization that Sorry, hold on one second. I apologize. I think Kaylee is going to draw something from the organization whose research um, Marianne had cited, the Migrant Workers Alliance. Yeah. Uh, so they currently on their website, if you go, hold on, let me see if I can put, I'm going to put this in the chat to everyone. Can I do that? To everyone. Mm -hmm. so the first one is... Um, that alliance is calling, uh, uh, has set out a number of uh, tangible ways yeah, that people, right. Oh, right. So my that people can support. Generation. Yes. yes. So my generation is very much, um, we're calling our government, we are showing up in the streets, but a conversation that we've been having is about the disparity in social and political capital, specifically political capital between our generation and our parents' generation. Um, because as, you know, hardworking and brilliant and, you know, variously employed as we are, most of us are not homeowners. Most of us are not business owners. Most of us don't have the kind of standing in the community. And it sort of feels like for every thousand millennials that show up to protest, if is like the equivalent political will of like 
five strongly worded letters from baby boomers. <laughs> I and hope that's not true. I hope so too, but I think there's really something to be said that in this time where protesting isn't viable for everyone because of COVID, um, that the difference between signing a petition and writing a personal letter on the subject is huge. And so I want to encourage everyone listening to, if, there, if this specific issue, which I think, right, if you go to migrantrights.ca, they have on their website right now a call to action asking citizens <laughs> to call the prime minister's office and demand full status now for migrant, temporary migrant workers, um, which would allow them to access that all, all the things that my fellow panelists have mm. enumerated. Mm. And I think, so I'm gonna ask everyone who's here and listening to call Justin Trudeau every day, every week, however much time you can spare on it, but call him, write him a letter directly to his office and keep writing and calling until he meets the specific mm. demand. Because, Kaylee, yeah. yes. I was just going to say, uh, um, so important what you what you've added here, the, the drawing the connection between the vulnerability of temporary farm workers and so many other people, especially young people in the labor market, connecting those dots, and reminding us that making things better is an intergenerational project. Uh, um, and, and uh, on that front of making things better, um, before we go to questions, and I know there are many questions out there, uh, I want to give each of the panelists a chance to offer, uh, well, I guess their best cure for the picture that we've been uh, diagnosing and describing. Um, uh, what kind of fix would help? To improve the situation we've been we've been talking about, so I'll go back to the same order we start we we began with. And um, Naomi, I'll ask you to get us started on that. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I actually have um, a few things that I think can be done. Some short term, some longer term. Um, I think right now it's far too easy for employers to get positive labor market impact analyses, uh, which allows them to then hire temporary foreign workers. And um, if they were to, I mean, now they just have to advertise and say that no one was interested in doing the work. Um, but perhaps no one's interested in doing the work because of the precarious working conditions, because of the pay because of the living conditions, because of all of that, because of their ineligibility for um, certain rights and benefits. So um, if employers would not so easily get their labor market um, assessments and would be, um, would have the incentive to improve wages, to improve working and living conditions, uh, they could potentially attract uh, domestic workers. And although there are um, a lot of temporary foreign workers, uh, there are many more people in Canada who would be prepared to do these, these jobs if the working conditions and salaries and everything else were, were better. So that would be, I mean, think about, I'm not saying that the working conditions are that much better, but there seems to be no problem getting young people to be tree planters in Northern Ontario. They're paid really well. There's no problem getting Quebec kids to ch pick cherries in BC because their living conditions are really much better. So there are ways, number one, um, to deal with that. Um, and by the way, that would also improve, improve all the conditions for the temporary workers that were still necessary, even once you have the domestic workers uh, doing this work. Um, number two, I think there's no question that we should go to sector specific work permits for temporary workers rather than employer specific ones. That means they could work anywhere in the agricultural sector and the market actually might work if, you know, an employer knew that they would get employees more readily if they paid more or if they provided better housing 
people would march with their feet and go to work for that employer rather than to stay with the bad apple employers. Um, number two, number three, I really think we have to have um, a process to get uh, federal, provincial, municipal bodies together to get agreements about who does what, uh, to develop some national standards, um, and I would say to get a joint inspectorate um, where there would be one inspector who would go in on a very regular basis um, and look at all the various requirements of employers rather than having individual inspectors going in or not even going in, just making a phone call. But the on-site um, ad hoc um, inspect, uh, inspections without uh, prior notice, and but the on-site is really important. I would make them certainly eligible for federal services, and I would make them eligible for EI. I would um, give them the right to organize across the country so they have representation to uh, um, uh, advocate on their behalf. Um, I would certainly have a pathway to permanent residency uh, that makes sense as opposed to the one pilot that is now in place that in my view does not make sense at all. And I think the most dramatic thing that I would propose, which I think has real merit, um, is to look at increasing the number of permanent entrants that come to the country who would be very happy to do good agricultural work that pays well. And I'm thinking particularly of many um, refugees, for example, who come from agricultural backgrounds who would, be, who would come here as permanent residents with full rights, full mobility rights, um, maybe they could be uh, selected in clusters uh, to work in, in local um, uh, rural areas, uh, but they would have permanent status and wouldn't be temporary and they would have a real um, uh, life that would be um, in some ways comparable to the lives um, that they had in their home countries with all the respect for that work that they did in their home countries. Uh, and making that contribution here. So I would say bring them in as permanent residents right from the get-go rather than as temporary foreign workers with a pathway to permanent residence. Bring them in as permanent residents and uh, take advantage of the skills and expertise and experience because people think that the agricultural work the temporary foreign workers do is unskilled. It's not unskilled. Um, and we could bring in people here on a permanent basis to do that very important skilled work, which we know is so essential for us. Naomi, thank you so much for that uh, really compelling uh, uh, prescription for change. Um, David McKee, your thoughts? Um, I'm going to have to pass. There's nothing I can say that would be as dramatic as Kaylee. <laughs> or as detailed as Naomi. So I have <laughs> nothing to add to this uh, conversation. I'm sorry. I got a few well, years, just not, not good enough. Uh, um, <laughs> no, the, the, uh, a lot has been put on the table. And I'm sure you would have covered a lot of those bases had they not come up already. So D D David, thank you. Marianne? Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, I, I think Naomi, well, that was fabulous. I mean, such a, a good list of prescriptions. And Kaylee, uh, thanks very much. I, I really. Um, uh, admire your, your your passion, and I think you've motivated us all. Uh, so I would just only emphasize a few of the things that Naomi said. I think that um, uh, the workers being able to switch employers is really important. I mean, I don't think that from what we've heard, they would stay under some of the conditions that we've heard about if they if they didn't have to. And then, of course, the inspection, the um, overlapping, confusing network of agencies. Um, just means that it's just not getting done. Uh, stop separating work from home. It's all together in this situation. Um, be clear, I don't know if we need to have the different ministries cooperating or just decide who's going to mm. do it and make sure that they, uh, that they really do enforce that. Um, housing standards is another thing that's been um, uh, advocated for by some of the organizations. And um, I think that's really important because clearly 
a lot of these workers are living in substandard housing and it needs to be inspected when people are, are in it, not when it's all sort of looking pristine and you have no idea how many people are going to really be in there. Mm. Marianne, thank you for those points of additional emphasis. And Kaylee. Oh, um, yeah, I guess I would just like to reiterate um, that you can call the prime minister <laughs> time you want. Uh, you can call the premier, and etc. Um, and to really encourage, oh, ha, ha. Uh, and to really encourage people um, to think about the COVID crisis and the moment that we're in as a moment of potential transformation. Um, that, oh, so the last thing I just want to say is like slide in Green New Deal <laughs> as a thing that might cover a lot of these things. Um, but that to my mind, for, from my perspective, the government is currently doing everything it can to do not much of anything except pay their friends more money. And so mm -hmm. if it's if that now is a really crucial time for all of us to stay engaged um, and to keep giving, yeah, everybody feedback. And I will say, I guess the second link that I put in the chat, in case anyone is interested, that the precariousness that my group of friends is currently facing that's connected to this um, has to do with COVID evictions and mm -hmm. ongoing over-policing. So if you're in a phone calling mood, uh, the second link is a script and a call to action about asking the mayor to ask to direct the Toronto police force to not enforce evictions during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to add an addendum, uh, well, you know, that's all that it is. <laughs> uh, so you can call John Tory, and when you're done with that, you can call your local city councillor and ask them to please remind John Tory to please cancel COVID evictions. <laughs> so those are my, yeah, those are my thoughts. Kaylee, thank you for keeping us grounded on the things that uh, we as citizens uh, can do. Um, so I think we are now ready to move into the question and discussion uh, phase of things. And I'm going to ask Mary Ann to uh, give us some logistical guidance on uh, how questions can be put to uh, the panelists. So uh, Mary Ann, over to okay. you for that. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to have questions. You can either type them in the chat box or you can ask them verbally. So if you type them in the chat box, um, make sure that it says everyone. The chat box is, um, if anybody has trouble finding the chat box, I'll tell you how to raise your hand, you can do that. Um, but at the bottom of the participants list, you can, you can go into chat or click chat at the bottom of your screen and make sure it says to everyone and we'll be monitoring questions that are in the chat box. The other way is if you want to speak, um, so what you need to do is raise your hand and then you will, we will unmute you. So the way you raise your hand virtually is um, go to the participants list and again, click participants at the bottom of the screen and you will see a list on, on your right and then scroll to the bottom of that and there should be an icon with a blue hand or the words raise hand and that will raise your hand. Um, so we will see you at the top of the participants list and then we'll unmute you and you can ask the question. Um, so I also did want to mention that this meeting is being recorded. So if you don't want to uh, be in the, in the recording, then you can turn off your video. And if you don't want your audio to be in, then don't ask a question verbally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to you, Meyer. Well, uh, I may actually return the volley uh, um, in terms of, um, quarterbacking now and, and, and stick handling the, the uh, um, uh, questions that come up. Um, Marianne and perhaps Kathy, will you be 
calling the, uh, the order of people on that? I will be. Okay, okay good. Thank, thank you, Kathy. I've gotten myself confused on that. Okay. Well, I can tell there, there are a lot of hands up, either real or, or um, by icon. Uh, so, Kathy, over to you to uh, organize and handle, so, coordinate all this. So I'm going to go back and forth between the chat questions and the hands up questions. So for the first chat question I found was, is there a country that uses the sector rather than employer approach to temporary foreign workers? I had a conversation with the NIF funded immigrant network in Israel and found that Israel also ties the worker to the employer as I understand it. I, it was, uh, it was, there was no specific panelist uh, yeah. associated with the question. So wh whichever one of you wants to take it, that would be, that would be great. I, I guess mean? I'll take it, but I, I actually don't know of um, other countries who start off with a sector specific um, work permit. Um, there are a few that, um, go to a sector specific permit after a period of time with an employer specific permit. Um, but um, I can't give you details, sorry. Okay, I'm going to call on Gloria Boxen to read her question, to, to tell us her question. So my, my question was, or I originally had it in the chat, was there in the past a, um, a pathway to permanent residency and uh, citizenship. I had the feeling that Harper did something to make things more difficult. Um, mm -hmm. And then I have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, th I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. Um, there certainly was a, um, the oldest program that we have in Canada that allowed for transition from temporary to permanent status was what used to be called the Live and Caregiver Program. And that was um, uh, a program that existed for many years under different names with different criteria, but basically allowed people to come initially as temporary foreign workers and after a period of time, it was almost an automatic transition to permanent residency without going through a lot of hoops. That was tightened up significantly and it's no longer automatic the way it used to be. Um, now there have been... Um, Naomi, uh, if I can jump in just for a second on, on the Live and Caregiver program, that of course was almost exclusively for personal care workers, for, for people coming in and doing child care or senior care. It was not for, for agriculture. No, 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 no. Yeah. I, I think, Gloria, were you asking specifically about agriculture? Yes. Oh. Okay. Okay, sorry, I misunderstood the question then. No, but Naomi, you're, you're right, of course, there was a pathway for some temporary foreign workers, but only those who worked as uh, pr primarily nannies and, and uh, personal care workers. And live in. And live in. And, live and, in and it had tight requirements around it. Yeah. Sorry, okay. Naomi, to jump in. Yeah. Now, the other, the yeah. other thing that I, I should just mention, um, although it's not specifically for agricultural workers um, either, there was a time where um, almost every seven years, Canada would have an amnesty program hmm. for undocumented people in the country. And there were certain criteria that had to be met, but they were not uh, very um, tough for people to meet. And that would allow people to uh, become permanent residents and then ultimately to become citizens. We haven't had an amnesty program for many, many, many years. Okay, so the next question is- uh, Hang on, I want to make a comment. So there, how are we for comments, Maya? Are we allowed uh, all I'll, uh, 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 Gloria, I'll ask you to be brief, but go ahead. Okay, so just very quickly, um, I have been troubled in the past by how cheap food is compared to, uh, it, you know, when we oh. were young, uh, it, it took like, 20% of your salary or 18%. Now it's just a small figure unless you, you are a precarious worker, of course. And that allows, so if, so let me quickly, if 
um, they were given a living wage, it would mean that everyone should get a living wage in order to be able to afford nutritional food. That's yeah, it. yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, so then the, the next question in the chat is a question for panelists. Other than the employers and their profit margins, what are the other factors or reasons or forces retaining all those conditions in place? In other words, mm -hmm. whose interests are being protected and why are the various government agencies retaining current regulations? I'd love to start on that one. Um, it is my understanding, and this is more for the US and it's possible that it's different here, but that the way that food works, the way that the food economy works is that farmers get subsidies. And really what pays for our food is subsidies in many complicated ways. And the panel can probably tell me if that's an incorrect or correct armchair analysis. Um, but that the difference in subsidies doesn't really affect the difference in what the employees are making. The difference in subsidies is how much the farm owner is taking home. It doesn't really, bigger subsidies don't tend to translate into better paid workers. And I, my contention from sort of a, a survey of all different kinds of food production of the ethical and supposedly unethical variety is that, um, again, organic farms, big and small, have the same problems because we treat food producers. We sort of have this cultural understanding of food producers as slaves. And that hasn't really changed like through any outlawing or reestablishing of slavery. The status of farm workers has remained the same. So I put forward that maybe it's it's more of a an, an issue of imagination than practicality per se. Mm. Mm. But feel free to contradict. Mm. Do others on the panel want to weigh in on that? Um, if I understood the question, and, and I, I'm not sure I did, was it why are we in this pickle? <laughs> I mean, why are we um, bringing in temporary foreign workers and treating them so badly? <sighs> is that wh who asked the question? Is that is that basically the question? That's an important question to come back to in any event, Naomi. So uh, I would I, I'd be interested in your answer yeah. to that. Um, I think, I think the major part of the question was whose interests are being protected yeah. by this system that we have in place. Okay, so um, I agree with Marianne that not all employers are bad apples and that not um, all employer, employers uh, treat their workers badly and not all employers hire temporary foreign workers because they can get away with treating them less well or paying them less well or whatever. Um, in some respects, I think our immigration system has forced employers to hire more temporary, wor temporary workers rather than um, uh, permanent residents or people already here in the country or people who would come into the country as permanent residents because our economic immigration program has become so focused on the highest, highest, highest human capital and so focused on the knowledge economy as if our entire economy is only the knowledge economy, that we have now a kind of bifurcated system where the you know, high skilled people that we want to come into the country are permitted to come in as permanent residents and everybody else has to come in as a temporary foreign worker because that's the only way the immigration system allows them to enter the country. And we have this, this crazy system now of, um, you know, the people allowed in as permanent residents um, are not the people who want to do some of the essential work um, that needs to be done in the country and we're relying on temporary foreign workers to do it. And I think that's a real problem. 
I mean, I think we really have to re-look at our permanent economic immigration class and see whether, um, if we're bringing them in, particularly to contribute to our economy, both short-term and long-term, uh, are we really looking at all the needs of our economy or just the very, very high-end ones? So. Mm. If I can just um, weigh in on the question of whose interests are being served, I mean, certainly the easy answer, it's the, it's the farmers, it's the employers, and I do understand they have very powerful lobbies, and look at the political makeup of Ontario, you know, look at where, where the votes are, and who elects MPs. Um, they certainly wield a lot of, of say. Um, but just to pick up on what Gloria said, whose interests? It's all of ours, because we have inexpensive food. So um, it's not that easy a problem to solve because if Ontario food prices go up, the competition from imported food will um, you know, be more pronounced. So it's, it's not that easy, but I think it is important to remember that in fact, we are benefiting from low wage um, agricultural workers. So the next question, Aggie, can you, uh, your hand is up next. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Oops. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm unmuted. Uh, the, 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 the whole issue, I think we have to look, I mean, we have our workers, our, our agricultural workers, but not only agricultural workers, uh, and we have low paying jobs for immigrants, and we can see a lot of our immigrants are not doing very well. Some of them are, but some of them aren't. I think we have to look at this whole problem as a complex system. Uh, and uh, one of the things that somebody mentioned, I think you, Naomi, or, or Marianne mentioned, is that there are so many different jurisdictions looking after different pieces of the puzzle. And nobody is looking at this in a holistic view as a very complex system that has to be addressed as a complex system. The, the other thing that I, I did want to say is, is, is that, first of all, uh, I, I don't, uh, to answer the question of whose interest is being served, our farmers are not the richest people in this country. Our farmers are, are, are actually hardworking and even, even industrial farms, uh, are, are, are not huge profit-making machines. So we really have to look at, I think, we really have to look at how, uh, how we can make um, food prices. I mean, we're paying, as uh, Gloria said, we're paying really very little for our food right now. But if, if those food prices go up, if wages go up, then food prices go up. If food prices go up, then a whole bunch of our other immigrants who are already in trouble and going to food banks will have a problem. So we can't just look at it as wages in the agricultural system uh, because as wages go up, prices will go up and other people will suffer. We have to approach the whole thing, and I don't know how to do it, but we have to get the government and people to understand that it's the whole system that has to be looked at so that, uh, so that we can make life better for everybody in Canada. And I might be an idealist or something, but there are, in science, if you look at complex systems theory, there is a way uh, in which these complex systems can be made to work together better. And I think we have to approach the issue from that perspective. And that means all of the industries and all of the levels of government, uh, as well as just the farm workers, that's a second step. I understand that, that our first step has to be to make living conditions better for our, um, uh, for our agricultural workers, be they permanent residents, be they uh, temporary workers. And I agree with everybody that we, we should really not have temporary workers. We should have, we, 
Canada needs more people. <laughs> Canada needs at least 100 million people in the next century to be able to function and compete in, in the world. And, and I think doing this temporary uh, worker thing is not adding to our um, communal or our national mm. well-being. Uh, so we do need to put an end to temporary workers, get them in as permanent residents, then they'll become good citizens and good citizens are what we need. These temporary workers are not, you know, they don't care about Canada. They, they get their pay and they take it wherever they take it. Aggie, thank, Aggie, thank you very okay, much for that very, as you say, holistic and, and s systematic way to try to address the issue. I wonder if the panelists have any thoughts or comments. Um, I guess I, it sounds like you are speaking to two separate issues. Um, one is the plight of temporary foreign workers currently, which absolutely is the first step. Um, but I, I think the observation that our food system is wildly, it, as a complex system is wildly flawed is an apt one. Um, food system, food production is an incredibly complex system. And I, I without, painting farmers as villains or painting really anyone as villains i just i want to to say that one of the last visited pieces and this is from agricultural experts who actually you know much more experience and credential than i is yes there's the pro efficient production part but that seems to take place in a separate conversation from the labor part. And I think that bringing those two, or recognizing that those are both part of the complex system is a good place to start. Haley, thank you for that. I'm mindful that uh, we have hit nine o'clock, um, which is, uh, um, we're just about to go into overtime compared relative to the hour and a half that I thought this conversation would go on for. And it's a good sign that there's obviously strong interest. I would suggest that maybe, Kathy, if you could summarize uh, uh, the questions that um, are before you online uh, as a group, that could be helpful. And uh, I'll uh, just to make sure that one gets included, there was a very early message that that um, asked, do we know what the wages and earnings of, uh, of uh, temporary foreign agricultural workers are? How much are they paid? So if that could get added to the collection of, of questions that still remain um, that uh, Kathy can, can uh, uh, summarize for us, I think, that, I think that would be very helpful. Thank Kathy? you. I, I also just got a message about, about that question and I was about to read that out. So we're yeah. all on Good. it. There is one uh, of 10 part questions with some A's, B's and C's that has a list of proposals. And uh, the question is to ask for the effectiveness and likelihood of uh, achieving the following te temporary migrant workers remedial measures. Um, I think if some diehards want to stay afterwards, that might be a thing to discuss, but I think that's, it would be a, very long to read out, not, not just to answer. Um, and that's, that's it for the written questions. So now we do have one, uh, we have about three or four hands raised. So, uh, so I, 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 I will want to self select and if they feel yeah. that their question is already fairly similar to one that's been asked or maybe is not as burning maybe they could volunteer to put their hand down. And if it's really burning, you know, we've got three burning questions still up Good. there. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, uh, why don't we hear those questions in, in sequence, add to that the earlier question about uh, the earnings of uh, temporary foreign workers, and that will be our summation point for uh, the discussion. Okay, so why don't, why don't we go with the, with the question about the earnings, and after that, I'll ask Marty to ask his question. Okay. 
So mm -hmm. my understanding about yep. the wages is that in Ontario, the uh, they're covered under um, Employment Standards Act, which means they should be entitled with, with some restrictions covered by minimum wage. So um, it may well be that David and and Naomi have more information on that. I, I did just in this context, I thought it was reasonable to mention that the report of the Migrant Workers Alliance says that often these um, workers have their uh, living expenses and food deducted from their wage. Yeah. And often they don't have a say in how much is deducted, right? Because like, this is your rent. So, um, you know, one of them said, we're actually working for the equivalent of $5 an hour because once they take all these deductions, um, that, that's what they were left with. So David, I saw you shaking your head. So I think, did you have any clarification? Yeah, um, the Employment Standards Act doesn't cover agricultural workers. Covers it's some. a, yeah, it looks like it does, but if you look at the regulations, uh, mm. agricultural workers are exempt from that whole list of uh, sections mm. of the act that I read out. Mm. So that's not going to help anybody. In theory, the contract tells you what you're going to be paid. Um, and I, I don't have any information about what it is. Harvesting is piecework. It always has been. It always will be. Um, more um, regular uh, or spaced out work is hourly or weekly or monthly. Those are the options under the contract. And again, in theory, you're supposed to know what the cost of, uh, of housing and uh, food is from that contract, whether it turns out not to be that way or people make other deals when they get there or whatever, I, I have no idea. So there are, there are some provisions that refer to the prevailing wage should be paid. Um, and there are some provisions that say that um, the temporary farm workers should not be paid less than others doing the same job on the same farm. Um, uh, there are, um, yes, there are uh, deductions made for housing, um, but there are uh, in the rules the amount of money that, the maximum amount of money that can be um, deducted on a weekly basis. Um, but th the issue is no matter what the rules say, if it's not enforced, um, it's not enforced. Mm. Okay, can we, um, yeah. can we ask Marty to speak and maybe uh, I feel badly about leaving out this long many part question. Maybe if, if one of the panelists could just quickly look it over um, and if they can uh, cover some of that after Marty speaks. Marty, you're on. Okay, I, I want to get back to COVID. Uh, uh, when we got back to Canada in March, uh, uh, we were reading stories, not just about Canada, but every industrial country uh, has, uh, depends on, on migrant uh, workers. Europe gets them from Poland or from, uh, Western Europe gets them from Poland, North Africa, US gets them from the same places we do. And, and, and the farmers, there was all this talk in March that, uh, that our food production was very much in danger. And the farmers insisted that the workers they brought in were more skilled than college students. And this is probably correct. <laughs> they, they knew how to pick strawberries, which, uh, uh, and, and the federal government looked at the program and it, and it developed this requirement of 14-day uh, of, uh, 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 quarantine. And so it then permitted, after studying the question rather briefly, the program to resume under pressure from uh, the farmers. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and the question, I have two questions. Uh, one, one is, is uh, did nobody think about the fact that you were quarantining people for two weeks and then moving them into bunkhouses? Uh, I mean, in, in a bunkhouse, even if you carefully control <laughs> things, if you have 200 people, as some of these farms are very big, uh, or a small number of them are very big, you have 200 people, 
you have one guy come in with uh, with uh, infected, and 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 you ha one of these farms has seventy five percent of their workers uh, got COVID uh, nineteen. And the second question: most farms didn't have a crisis. Uh, you had farms that had one hundred and sixty seven uh, uh, victims. We had a lot of farms that didn't have any at all, and a, a, a large number. And I wonder what the good employers did. And that is, was there a good policy that the, that the Fed should have insisted on that could have been done? I think I know what it is, but I want to know what, mm. what, uh, uh, what you know about mm. the quote unquote good employers. One final question. The farmers are not, uh, don't uh, uh, have much clout individually. It's the, it's the agricultural industry that has a lot of clout. The farmers, there are a limited number of farmers everywhere. Uh, and and, and the, the farmers are outvoted by the towns in, in the towns and, and, and the, what the, what, what puts pressure on Ottawa is the agricultural industry. Hmm. Anyway, but that's the two questions. Thanks, Marty. Over to the panel. Okay, well, in terms of COVID, um, well, I, I'm not sure you can totally say that there, the farms where there was no COVID was because the employers were good. I mean, let's hope that is the reason. But of course, luck has something to do with it. If you don't have an introduction of somebody who is infected, you're not going to infect everyone else. So it's kind of clear that somebody had to be introduced in the um, in close proximity to the other people probably living with them in order for the infection to spread. And I think that's that's clearly what happened. I mean, there were a lot of stories of employers not following the rules in terms of quarantine, in terms of mixing people who come from from other countries, in terms of not having housing that. Um, allowed them to be separated enough. Um, but I also want to say that just having housing, even if they could stay six feet apart, if you have a lot of people in one um, relatively, one unventilated area, if someone has COVID, it's going to spread for sure. So, um, you know, maybe that wasn't known, you know, early on in the pandemic, there was a lot of, well, if you just stay six feet apart, everything will be okay. Um, clearly, that hasn't hasn't really been the case. Um, so I think I think that it's it's just clearly overcrowding, working close together, sometimes just not following the rules about quarantine at all, and asking them to go to work as soon as they got there, which we did hear stories of. Hmm. Okay, so I see the same people with the hand up and with a comment in the chat. Uh, the comment in the chat is nothing to do with them. Employers. It was always about workers coming through airports in contact with people with COVID. Would anybody like to comment on that? Um, I Sorry, I'm not sure I really understand the question. Um, I, think, I, think this, I, think, I think the suggestion there is that the transmissibility of, uh, of COVID in on farms with with um, migrant farm workers occurred because of exposure at airports in transit. Well, no. In fact, all all the people who came in as temporary foreign workers had to be quarantined when they when they came in, and all of them were. And none of them had COVID when they were in quarantine and none of them had COVID when they went to the farms. It was after they went to the farms that um, they got COVID. So it had to do with either the proximity um, for living or the proximity for working conditions or lack of sanitation. Um, but it wasn't that they brought it with them because they, were, they didn't go to the farms until they were clean. <clears throat> Thanks for that. Mary Ann, that's 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 right. That was certainly the intent. I mean, we we don't yeah. know for sure. Remember, early on, uh, people didn't know that there was asymptomatic transmission. 
That's so true. people yeah. could have come in, they could have been infected, even if they were tested, you know, you can get it in between when you're tested and, and, and when you yeah. arrive, if, if they're not showing any symptoms, yeah. um, then they yeah. can spread the infection. Yeah. Okay. But um, what, how people are describing the COVID as community transmission once after they arrived, as opposed to the workers bringing it with them. Yeah. I think that's most likely, you know, yeah. because we okay. do know that people from the community were going, sent to work on the farm. Hmm. I don't want to get in, tr in trouble with employment standard enforcement officers who are now 15 minutes into overtime here. <laughs> so I'm going, to, I'm inclined to declare that we've reached uh, and approached uh, the end of this uh, really interesting in informative session. I, so above all else, a huge thank you to Kathy Sikora who uh, organized and coordinated and made uh, our connections possible. And to our um, really terrific panel of Naomi Alboim and David McKee and Marianne Levitsky and Kaylee uh, Blick, uh, thanks so much for, for telling us so much and, and uh, 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 I guess for two things, for uh, um, increasing our understanding of the nature and scope of the issue and I think for making us a lot more uncomfortable the next time we're in the produce section of a supermarket. Uh, like it in the end, it is all on us. L l like, you know, we are the citizens of this country and it does seem like, like th we are a country that has agreed and found acceptable to create a special cohort or cast of people who will work in the agricultural sector with all kinds of attendant problems. So I want to close by uh, reminding us of, of, of uh, Kaylee's uh, urging that we all try to do what we can and have our voices heard. Uh, the single, I think, starting point for people who are interested would be, as, as Kaylee has put online for us, to, to check out the website of the Migrant Workers Alliance. They have a number of requests for how people can, can support their, their cause. In addition to what may be on that website, uh, we've heard many times that uh, um, contacting directly as citizens, your elected representatives, and in this case, it involves federal, provincial, and local, would have an impact, would be important for them to know that Canadians care about this issue and would like to see improvement. And um, on that score, I think we all have some work to do. Uh, so really, I thank the, the panel for just a, a, a terrifically insightful and thoughtful uh, series of presentations and enlightening of us. Thank you, thank you. Can I just Meyer. ask one question of Kathy Sikora? Yes. Um, I know this was taped. Is it going to be accessible? Because I think um, it might be useful to use some of the material from this as part of advocacy with, yeah. um, with members of parliament or with members of the legislature um, and sending some of these clips might, yes. be, might be useful. I think that's an excellent idea. I'm sure it can be done. Certainly technically it can be done. In terms of show policy, I have no idea. But if you speak with Joanna tomorrow, I'm sure she will be give you all the goods. It is technically, I think there's no problem of accessing it. It's more a question of, you know, what use is it okay to put it to? But I'm and sure that she and you can come up, come to a good agreement. And it helps having the show president on the panel. <laughs> yes, you forgot to mention that in the bio. Yes, yeah, bio, yeah, that yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, thank you, David. Yeah. 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 Um, I also want to thank you, Meyer. I mean, this was your inspiration. I, I couldn't believe how fast you pulled it together um, and inspired us to pull it together. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. And I actually did want to call attention. There is that long chat from Shalom Shakhtar in the chat box if anybody wants to look at these ideas. I think they're very good ideas, even if we don't have time to comment on them. So um, I have okay. saved the chat and I will, I will right. certainly send, uh, send that to the panelists.
So if you want to see that question, it, it was a very, very involved, but very interesting question. Great. Thank you to our terrific panelists and thank you to all of you who joined and were part of this conversation. And uh, we will be connecting in other virtual ways and hopefully before very long face-to-face um, -face ways uh, at uh, Darke Noam. Uh, thank you to those from Darke Noam who were with us and those beyond our community who uh, also were with us. And a good night to all. Good night. Good night. Good night.